16 is a tricky age. It's in that awkward transition phase where your memories of childhood are still fresh, but changes are happening that force you to think about the future. Late adolescence can be fraught with conflict, uncertainty and nasty setbacks. And if you've ever felt like rebelling and running away from it all, Holden Caulfield gets it. He's the protagonist or main character of The Catcher in the Rye and knows firsthand how rocky things can get on the path to maturity. Holden's sarcastic narrative voice, which is the voice Salinger created to tell the story, reveals how life so far has made Holden cynical. Check out the novel's opening lines. If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. Hey team, just a reminder, if you like this video, please hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell. It really helps the channel out and our next upload could be on something taught in your next class. Thanks and back to the video. Holden's colloquial language, or informal way of speaking with semi-rude words like lousy and crap, is his signature style. It may not be polite, but it's also a relief to hear a real voice for a change. We're compelled to engage with Holden, thanks to his direct address, where he speaks directly to the reader as you. By acknowledging the presence of the reader, Salinger deliberately breaks the fourth wall, or the imaginary barrier between the fictional world of Holden Caulfield and our real world. This invites us to immerse ourselves in the trials and tribulations of our teen protagonist. Well played, Mr. Salinger. We're hooked. Salinger's allusion or reference to Charles Dickens' novel, David Copperfield, signposts the novel as a Bildungsroman. A Bildungsroman is a story that follows the psychological and moral development of a person as they grow up or come of age. In Holden's case, the narrative time frame is limited to some madman stuff that happened to him around last Christmas, just before he got pretty run down and had to come out here and take it easy. So, the key events of the story occur within a few crucial days, not Holden's entire childhood. What's implied here is that those few days were a turning point in Holden's life. The euphemism, pretty run down, is a more pleasant way of saying the blunt truth that Holden's rebellion nearly killed him. He was forced to take it easy in a sanitarium or long-stay hospital in California. That's about as bad as growing pains get. So how did things get so bad? Most of the conflict in the novel stems from Holden's inner struggle to accept change. Salinger highlights this in the novel through symbolism, or objects that represent this bigger idea. This includes Holden's iconic red hunting hat, the ducks on the lagoon in Central Park, and the Museum of Natural History. These symbols have become synonymous with Holden Caulfield and his ongoing battles with maturity, change, and the inevitable march of time. So let's look at how Salinger makes these symbols work in the novel. Like any teenager, Holden tries to distinguish his identity through his personal style, and his red hunting hat is the ultimate accessory. It has one of those very, very long peaks, and he wears it with the peak way round the back, which he admits looks very corny, but he really got a bang out of that hat. This is a colloquial expression that means he got a thrill out of wearing it, but how does a hat give someone a thrill? In the conservative setting of Pensy Prep, which is where the action in the novel first takes place, Holden's individuality is at stake. With his hat, Holden begins to express himself and exercise what little control he has over his life. Even after he leaves Pensy and embarks on his adventure in Manhattan, 
Holden keeps his hunting hat close by. The hat is mentioned so frequently in the narration that it becomes a motif or recurring symbol. It represents Holden's struggle to maintain his quirks in a society that expects conformity and maturity in young men. Holden declares that he didn't give a damn how he looked in the hat, but that's not entirely true, is it, Holden? He took it off before checking into the Edmund Hotel because he didn't want to look like a screwball or weirdo. And he only wore it in public when he knew he wouldn't meet anybody that knew him. Like on his walk to the Museum of Natural History. Thus, the pressure to conform and appear mature is an ongoing battle for Holden, even in the midst of his rebellion. The museum is another important symbol in the novel. It represents Holden's futile yearning for things to stay the same. As Holden walks, Salinger takes us on a deep dive into Holden's memories using stream of consciousness. This is when a character's thoughts and feelings are recorded in a continuous flow. Holden describes his childhood visits to the museum in stunning detail, but the best thing, though, in that museum was that everything always stayed right where it was. Nobody'd move. So... The exhibits were cool, but the best thing was that the place seemed immune to change. But life isn't like that. You can't just put certain things in one of those big glass cases and just leave them alone. This is another turning point for our protagonist. Just as he gets to the museum, a funny thing happened. All of a sudden, I wouldn't have gone inside for a million bucks. It just didn't appeal to me. This epiphany, or sudden realisation, is an unexpected step towards maturity. Holden's instincts prevent him from entering the museum because he's not 10 years old anymore. Even though he loved that damn museum, the thing that attracted him to it, the comforting illusion of time on pause, no longer serves him. But Holden still has a lot to learn. His fixation with the ducks on the lagoon at Central Park South leads him to do something silly. The ducks are another motif Salinger uses to symbolise Holden's immaturity and fear of change. He first thinks about them when he dissociates in Mr Spencer's presence. I was wondering where the ducks went when the lagoon got all icy. I wondered if some guy came in a truck and took them away to the zoo or if they just flew away. This little stream of consciousness reveals Holden's naivety, as if there's a man in a duck truck. The ducks must adapt to changing circumstances on their own, not wait for someone to save them, but Holden struggles to accept this principle, so he goes to Central Park late at night in the freezing cold just to see what the hell the ducks were doing. Of course, he didn't see a single duck and kept worrying that he was getting pneumonia and going to die. That's Holden's reward for being in denial about change and the importance of adaptation. Oh, and he also really does get sick. This incident is the catalyst for Holden's climactic visit to Phoebe, which is one of the highest points of tension in the novel. He visits her because he started thinking how old Phoebe would feel if he died. He admits it's a childish way to think, but that's his reasoning for sneaking home and risking a confrontation with his parents. However, once he's there, Holden takes another small step towards maturity and gives Phoebe his hunting hat. She didn't want to take it, but I made her. I'll bet she slept with it on. This symbolic gesture portrays Holden's brotherly love and his willingness to make sacrifices on the road to adulthood. In the novel's denouement, or resolution, Phoebe lends Holden the hat when it begins to rain. In this moment, Holden realises the hat's inadequacy. My hunting hat really gave me quite a lot of protection, 
in a way, but I got soaked anyway. The subtext, or underlying message here, is that there's only so much you can do to shield yourself from the world. Eventually, the responsibilities of adulthood will rain down on you, and there's very little you can do about it. But despite Holden's symbolic acceptance of this principle, he doesn't undergo a wild transformation. Far from it. In the novel's Coda, where Holden makes his final remarks while recovering in hospital, Salinger maintains the realism. Remember, realism is when a composer tries to truthfully represent aspects of real life without exaggeration or embellishment. And our final impression of Holden is still very much on brand. Holden scoffs at this one psychoanalyst guy who keeps asking him if he's going to apply himself when he goes back to school next September. Even after Holden's ordeal, which began with his expulsion from Pensy and ended with him practically getting TB, he still views adult expectations with adolescent contempt. At 17, Holden still has some growing up to do. Which is fair, don't you think? Great job, team. You've just done a thorough analysis of the theme of growing pains in The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. Now you can write mature responses to this classic novel, but don't forget to also enjoy your youth while it lasts. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.